We're so pleased to have uh, Dr. Bloom here with us. He's got a PhD from North Carolina. He's been teaching at GVU in the mathematics department for 22 years. And uh, the integration of faith and science has always been a major component of Dr. Bloom's personal spiritual journey. And if you've ever had a class, sometimes he does this thing called Philosophy Friday, where he takes 15 minutes or 10 minutes or so in the class to blow your mind. So he's published uh, numerous papers, one of them being, just to illustrate the sense of humor that I love, the key and intelligent sense of humor, he published a paper for um, the American Mathematical Monthly, um, in which in the bio he had put in, he, speaking of himself, wrote the present paper as part of a larger effort to deceive his engineering students about the undeniable fact that knowledge and probability will be utterly irrelevant for their future careers. <laughs> So anyways, he's also written a book on the integration of faith and science called Science and Spirit, Why Matter Isn't All That Really Matters. So, um, we're pleased to have Dr. Bloom speak about problem knowledge of pupils and materialism. He discusses how materialism has corrupted science, culture, and human experience. How this corruption can be undone with an adequate Christian perspective. So, Dominic, if you could lead us in prayer. Um, and then we'll get started with um, All right. Please stop. Our Father who is in heaven, we just come to you right now. We just want to thank you for this wonderful opportunity that we have together to listen to Dr. Bloma, to hear what he has to say. And Father, we just pray that as we sit here and listen to him, that you open our ears and our minds to be able to hear and have a greater understanding of whatever it is in your creation that Dr. Bloma is presenting to us. We love you, we trust in you, we just ask you to bless the whole rest of the night and our time together. In your son, Jesus, precious and holy name we pray. Amen. And one last thing before we get started, we have this sign-in sheet. If you can please go ahead and write your name, that way we can keep track of attendance and see how many people come to our events and such. And if you'd like further information uh, regarding future views events or future opportunities of membership, that kind of thing, go ahead and write your email on it as well. And we'll go, we'll go ahead and we'll just pass this from the table to table. Okay. 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 Thank you. Um, in fact, um, thank you. Um, in fact, actually, uh, many of the ideas <laughs> are actually in this book that Dante uh, just mentioned uh, in the, the book on science and spirit. So anyway, let's uh, see here uh, the problem of knowledge and the pitfalls of materialism. And uh, I'm hoping to give also, you see, a little bit of a personal uh, twist to this, and um, but uh, let's first actually see, you see, uh, the problem of knowledge uh, can never be solved, but let's talk about it anyway. <clears throat> so we will not go very deeply into this, you see, it's also, I mean, so many people have written about it, but we can maybe ask the question, uh, why do we actually want to know? See, uh, why do we desire to know? And if you ask yourself, what is the typical situation in which you desire knowledge? And um, for instance, when you are afraid of something, you see that it's usually a situation where you uh, don't know what's going to happen. And so as you then, you see, maybe uh, know the circumstances or the surroundings better, you see, then also, of course, you feel less afraid. And so in this sense, you see, knowledge is something that has a strong uh, psychological motivation behind it because it reduces fear, and um, not only, of course, in human life, um, so fear is overcome in familiarity, not only in human life, of course, but also, you see, in the life of animals. And this is Curry the cat. It's actually no longer alive. The cat died um, in 2012 in a dog fight that was actually said, but she died like a hero, see. <laughs> so, um, we actually have another cat who looks just like that. And, uh, but, um, so Curry the cat, actually, one thing that I observed of her, you see, is that she had these strange habits, and uh, people, of course, in biology, uh, in uh, ethology, that is in animal behavior, they have studied those things. There are many animals that have these half habits. And um, so this cat actually had an interesting habit. You see, whenever it was, um, I mean, when it wanted to go out in the garden, then it would usually go underneath the table and uh, uh, then, uh, I mean, not actually hang directly for the outside, but always, you see, under the table and then um, go from there into the garden. So, so sometimes it happens that we come home from, uh, let's say, you see, um, grocery shopping or so, and then we just uh, put the bag there at the entrance of the door and we carry the bags in. And then uh, as the door opens, then the uh, curry is uh, trying to get out, right? 
but um, she is not uh, used to having a bag there. So actually what she does is she goes for another loop around the table and then tries again to get out. And so that sometimes also doesn't work, then she goes for another loop, you see. And um, so that's kind of strange. And what we can see here is in a sense that actually knowledge reduces flexibility, you see. So the cat is, I mean, you say it's a dumb cat, you see, but, um, but actually human beings aren't that different, you see. So first of all, here for cats, you might say naturally that um, in a natural environment, habitual acquaintance with um, a certain territory can be of great survival value, of course, uh, for it may facilitate the search for food that also aid a quick escape in case of predators charming. So it's just safe, you see, in case if you have to run away from a predator, then you know your path. Um, it's safer to uh, maybe even sometimes take a longer path than to take a short one uh, because you see the longer path is the one that you know the short one might have an obstacle in, in its way that the animal will uh, stumble and then you see get caught by the predator. So it is, uh, it's a safety device, you see, again, knowledge as a way to be safer, you see. And uh, of course also it may um, just uh, also help the animal to find prey, possibly. Uh, but uh, what is required at the outset when you have the situation is of course some basic means of knowledge acquisition. That means initially a new terrain must be explored so that its uh, features can be entered into memory. And when this is done, however, the knowledge does produce will tend to fossilize as now a habit is established. Okay, so this is when flexibility is in a sense lost, you see. So here we have a case where flexibility is lost as knowledge is increased. So courage reluctance, for example, to circumnavigate an obstacle is a sign that her knowledge of all living room effectively diminishes her cognitive adaptiveness. And so of course the claim is you see or the natural extension is that this actually also happens in human life. And we humans, just as animals, also tend to cling to that which we have learned and know. We too are creatures of habit. You see, it's just it's not always fear-based, right? I mean, you don't have a habit uh, going to bed at a certain time just because you're afraid to go ahead and fall later. But it's sort of like naturally, see, in our makeup that we have habits and stick to certain traditions and so forth. And um, so by implication, also, we may also suffer loss of cognitive agility. As our knowledge is increased in a particular domain, as science, for example, we easily lose sight of other aspects of reality and our field of vision thus contracts. So knowledge can not only see broaden our horizons, but also can cause them to shrink. And um, it can, for instance, turn scientists, and that's, you see, what I want to talk about, uh, it can turn scientists into materialists, right? Materialism is sort of like a very limited uh, interpretation of science, where uh, you take basically science to be all um, encompassing and uh, the final word and everything. And uh, that is, you see, exactly what I want to talk about. So it's an instance where actually also our horizons shrink as our knowledge is increased, so it seems, in scientific knowledge in this case. And if you think about it, you see, um, this, uh, it's, this, this idea that actually knowledge is, can be a problem is, of course, also, you see, found in the book of Genesis, in the Bible, I mean, you see, there it actually is uh, uh, the case that, um, I mean, the fall of man is actually a sort of, like an increase in knowledge, namely you see the knowledge of good and evil in this case. And uh, my claim, of course, is that um, we have similar situations inside. Scientific knowledge is increased leads us to materialism. It's something similar. That the Bible doesn't say speak about materialism in this context, but um, that may seem be uh, something to at least think about. So the rift between God and man is open as man's knowledge is increased. And um, as we, as I said, you see, it could be, for instance, that if you uh, use knowledge as a means of fear reduction, you see, you rely more on knowledge than maybe on faith and so forth, you see, and uh, as you maybe then move into the direction of materialism, which, are, which is what we talk about, then uh, maybe you, you lose sight of God altogether because you don't think there is such a thing as a transcendent God in which there can be a God, right? And so materialism then in this context, you see, might be considered, or that's at least what I'm proposing here, you see, uh, the original sin of of uh, modern scientific thought, you see. And in essence, it is the belief that the physical world, that human sense perception, that means everything you can see, feel, touch, or so forth, as you are here, uh, is really all it is. And this is not great, you see, a claim here about um, uh, materialism, because that goes in the direction of how do we know not what is there. 
materialism with me and see what is their matter, basically. But um, it is usually assumed in science, and that's why many scientists are materialists, because that we actually can also understand everything then that is there because it is just material in nature. Okay? So, but I say materialism is wrong, totally, utterly wrong. Okay? And uh, here's a crazy example. Uh, I will actually not show the video <laughs> in case you were wondering, because it's a bit stark. I will just show you, see, it's crazy, and you will maybe not believe it, and so forth. But I could show you the video where he actually does his performance. He does it actually in a hospital in uh, Switzerland in front of uh, professors at the university, and it's all documented, and it's not actually fake, I believe. I mean, it could be, of course, possibly the same, but I think the chance is very low. So, in any case, this is an example that materialism is not true. And there are many others. I mean, last year I talked about uh, near death experiences. Perfect example also because so many people have experienced and they are verifiable. This is another thing that actually didn't happen. I mean, I honestly claim that if you say I'm crazy, okay, fine. I mean, it doesn't matter. I think still it's true. Uh, because I, could, I can show you the video if you want to at the end after the talk or after the hour. But um, in any case, so this uh, man here is man from the Netherlands, uh, Arnold Garrett Johannes Hensky is his original name, but he called himself for his performances near and dying. And uh, he actually says, um, speaks of Jesus as the most spiritual revelation of God in man and asserts that the miracles of the Bible, the healings, the walking on water, and the calming of the storm are in not mere fables, but did in fact happen. By means of these miracles, Dyer says, Jesus justified his word. So he actually wrote very inspiring um, things about uh, life in general and uh, spiritual life and so forth. And this is his CCS statement, and you might, you might find it interesting because we're Christian. Yeah? And, um, and this is how you see, you think it's crazy, but this is actually his uh, display where it's a human fountain, so they actually um, pierce him with uh, these metal rods and then uh, actually have water pushed through them, so it becomes basically a human fountain. He's like, how can it be? And he would die, naturally. Well, he actually did, okay? And uh, he did this in front of, <laughs> so it's crazy, I know, it doesn't matter. Uh, he did this in front of, you see, people in the hospital in uh, Zurich, I mean, the professors examined him, it was not a stage setting. He was led to the x-ray machine and they saw the thing through his body. He pierced here through like this, you see. And um, I can show you the video, it's all documented. Nobody has ever claimed it was uh, just a fake. And it's actually true. And um, he was in, in, in uh, he wrote letters, he was in correspondence with Einstein, for example, at Princeton University, so he was fairly famous in his time. But he has been altogether forgotten. Why? Because it would show you that what we teach us our universities, maybe materialism is just not true. So we have to forget all of those things. We have to push them, you see, in, into the background. It's not allowed, right? That it's not allowed to actually look at those examples. So um, that said, I mean, I can show you this. You see, I don't want to show it here because I don't want anybody to fall unconscious. You see, because that actually happens to me sometimes when I see these things. You see, I actually do fall unconscious. But um, anyway, so that's why. See, it's a bit stark, that's why I didn't want to show it. But this actually, I can show it to you, uh, the video, and also it's a book written, and it's all documented and everything. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, where actually does the road of uh, materialism lead to? So I said it's wrong, but you see, many people still uh, travel that road. And I cannot directly see, speak for everyone, what is their motivation, but I can certainly speak for myself. And in my case, and that's where I want to make it a little bit personal also, it ends in total loss of meaning. I mean, this is what I actually have experienced. And this is why, actually, I'm in this room right now, because I would never have to see, um, accepted a job or to apply for a job in the university, a Christian university, to work for this fact that I actually once, once in the materials and totally had is he lost all sense of meaning in this experience. So, um, just uh, three quick points here. My first serious um, experience, interest in Christian, the Christian phase was at age 15. So that's when you sort of like start thinking a little bit more deeply maybe about life. And, and uh, so I was thinking, yeah, I mean, so how do I actually sort things out? And, and I had a friend who was a Catholic and he took me to church services uh, in Berlin and we also, I bought the Bible and so I started the Bible. But then, you see, I felt, well, I mean, I was also learning science and uh, it just didn't really seem to be see, plausible that people can walk on water, you see, or maybe pierce themselves. <laughs> I mean, that's not in the Bible, but that's sort of the same thing. And, uh, or can, you see, uh, hear people instantly, or whatever, you see, all these miracles that are in the Bible just didn't seem to me to make much sense. And um, then, um, can I actually be honestly a Christian if 
really I have to reinterpret the whole Bible uh, to make it fit science, you see, and then it becomes just a philosophy that isn't really faith anymore, isn't it supernatural anymore? And um, so, I mean, this, this experience, you see, uh, generated in me a sense of total meaninglessness because, you see, when you're just basically a physical system, I mean, there's nothing else, I mean, I don't have a soul, you see, nothing. It's just sort of empty, you see, it's just a shell, basically, that you are, that somehow can talk and somehow experience, but it's nothing really in there. And um, even, you see, if you perform an act of kindness, I mean, whatever you might do, you see, to uh, maybe be kind to your neighbor, you see, uh, um, do some favor, so you see, it's all, it all doesn't matter, nothing matters, because, I mean, you, this, you see, not, no act of kindness ever has escaped the grave, right? You just die, and then whatever you did, good or bad, it will just be forgotten, there's nothing left. So, I mean, it just doesn't make any much for um, in terms of meaning. And uh, you see, at this time, when I was like 26, this is how about how long it took me, so from 15 to 26, you see, then I came at the University of North Carolina, I still remember, you see, I had actually been going this direction and somehow I had made the decision to actually believe. I mean, I wanted to believe in God, I did not, um, uh, yet I was not really Christian, so I just said, okay, I have to believe. I mean, I have to make this leap of faith, you see. And um, so I went to the bookstore, and there was this book by Leo Tolstoy, Confession and Other Religious Writings. And I checked <laughs> the four years that I was there. It was never again in that bookstore, see. Just this one day when I needed this book, you see, it was actually there. And I'm mentioning this here because Leo Tolstoy actually had the same experience that I had. He was also a hardcore materialist, you see, and had totally lost all sense of meaning. And his life actually, uh, he, he describes in this uh, quote, uh, all this last part, this is um, yeah, an introductory uh, comment on his quote. All his life, Tolstoy had been committed to the idea of self-perfection in action and thought. But when he reached his later middle age, this progress-based philosophy of his became quite suddenly a heavy burden on his heart. Here's how he puts it. Before occupying myself with my Samara estate, um, with the education of my son, or with the writing of books, I had, I had to know why I was doing these things. While I did not know why, I could not do anything. Amidst my thoughts, so he was a really famous man, so so amidst my thoughts, uh, thoughts concerning the farm, which at the time kept me very busy, a question would suddenly come into my head. Well, fine, so you will have 6,000 desert teens in the Samara province, 300 horses, and then what? And feeling completely taken aback, I would not know what to think next. Or uh, beginning to reflect on, my ed on the education of my children, I would ask myself, why? Or deliberating on how the peasants might achieve prosperity, I would suddenly ask myself, what concern is it of mine? Or thinking about the farm, the fame my own writings uh, brought me, I would say to myself, well, fine, so I will be more famous than Google, Pushkin, Shakespeare, Moliere, uh, more famous than all the writers in the world, and so on. And I had absolutely no answers. And uh, um, when I put, further quote, when I put my questions, this is, this is hardcore materialistic thinking, yeah. when I put my questions to one branch of human knowledge, which is the scientific branch, I received a countless number of precise answers to things I had not asked. Uh, the chemical composition of the stars, the movement of the sun towards the constellation Hercules, the origin of species and of man, the forms of infinitely tiny atoms, the fluctuations of infinitely small and imponderable particles of ether. But the only answer this branch of knowledge provided to my question concerning the meaning of life was this. You are that which you call your life. You are a temporary incidental accumulation of particles. The mutual interaction and alteration of these particles produces in you something that you refer to as your life. This accumulation can only survive for a little bit the length of time. When the interaction of these particles ceases, that which you call your life will cease, bringing an end to all your questions. You are a randomly united lump of something. This lump decomposes and the fermentation is called your life. The lump will disintegrate and the fermentation will end together with all your questions. This is the answer given by the exact side of knowledge, and if it adheres to its principles, it cannot answer them. I don't, I don't want to uh, take away your enthusiasm for science, okay? <laughs> but um, basically, this is when science is everything, right? I mean, if there's nothing else other than science, then this is it, you see? And uh, so that sort of was my view of reality. I was just sometimes I'm quite a brush my teeth, you see? I mean, I will lose many ways of way, you see? I don't care. It's, it's just like that, you see, so it's nothing that makes sense, you see. And uh, so in, the, in his depressive, materialistic face, he became Christian then afterwards, 
Tolstoy believed, as I did too, that the human being is just a temporary incidental accumulation of particles. Thus, he was playing the materialistic, reductionistic, and entirely, entirely foolish modern just game, according to which. So, reductionistic means just, okay? This is basically here when you to continue. Humans are just material systems. Animals are just souls of phenomena. For example, René Descartes is here at the beginning of the modern scientific era. He said animals are just actually machines. They have no feelings. You can be the pig, see it, go and squeak, or whatever, but it actually doesn't feel anything. It's just a machine because it doesn't have, you see, the same consciousness as human beings. So, um, this is a material theory of um, animals, for example, <coughs> and um, consciousness is just an epic phenomenon. It's just sort of something attached, you see. It doesn't really have any, even though you never know reality apart from your consciousness. Even Still, it's just something sort of that has no real substance. Meaning is just a presumption. Morality is just a convention. Religion is just a neurosis. God is just an illusion. And ultimately, everything is just a nothing. And that's really where you end. That's always where you end. Because there's nothing. I mean, it's just particles and what are particles? Nothing. I mean, it's like, um, yeah, to illustrate this game, and maybe see it helps you also um, to take a different look at this uh, from a totally different way. We look at some paintings. Okay, and uh, see actually how this game of reduction, this scientific game, see where you reduce everything to just the particles, and maybe the particles set to mathematical formulas, and then you see the formulas uh, to axioms that maybe uh, you have in order to give meaning to these uh, formulas. So in the end, there's nothing left. Um, to illustrate how this game is played, let's look at some paintings by Pete Mondrian. So this is a red tree. Um, so this obviously is a tree, and so it, it, it's a red tree that he um, painted, I think, in 1908. And um, it uh, is actually, at this stage, you see a little, this, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, it's not meant to be in the direction of abstraction very much. It is sort of two-dimensional. You can see that by the way he puts the color in between the branches there. But, uh, so it's a bit of reduction. It's not really spatial. But um, it is inspired more by Matisse, in fact, then it is inspired by maybe Cubist or uh, what came later. So the next tree, you see, is the great tree of 1910. So this is already more abstract, right? So it's more reduced, right? Reductionism, right? So you reduce it to its essential elements, right? So that's what I'm trying to get across, you see, that's the reduction, I mean, in visual form, get across, right? Um, so uh, this is, you can still see the tree, you can still see the branch, it's clearly very much two dimensional, and it is not, uh, it doesn't have the, um, structure anymore, the um, naturalistic structure it has in the previous one, and then he goes further, right? And I'm not saying this is still meant to be the same picture, but this is where he was led, right? From this cubist picture that we just saw, um, the great tree, then, you see, it's just like that, they say, I can do that myself. Yeah, I mean, you didn't, and so, that, therefore, this is a million dollars, and your painting is not, <laughs> But, um, anyway, um, so, uh, that doesn't matter, you see, it's still the same idea, see, it's sort of the same spirit you reduce, you want to see in mathematics, in physics, you want to see, you see, things in the most uh, abstract and universal way, you see, in the mathematical purity you want to see in the laws of nature, you see, and, uh, and then it goes further, this is now even more rigid, but um, there still is, uh, these colors are a little bit fuzzy, and so it goes even further, of course, you see, and then you have only primary colors and also the squeeze to the side and it's just basically black and white to see an example of painting. Actually, I thought of, <laughs> I kind of like these paintings. Uh, that's because I'm a mathematician and you say, well, that's weird, you see, but um, that's just the way I actually have some, I mean, that's why I study math. You see, it's not that I totally reject all this. It just, it has to be, oh, I see if you know, maybe the sound is better than mine. Right? Uh, it has to be just, uh, that um, it has to be embedded in something larger, right? Uh, then just that, right? And uh, of course, next picture, I uh, didn't paint that, okay? I took this in, okay? Uh, but this is where it could end, right? This is nothing in the end, you see? And uh, there is actually an anecdote, whether it's true or not, I don't know, you see, but that could be true. There's an anecdote told about Mondrian, according to which he once spent an entire afternoon sitting in front of a virgin white canvas unable to make a single mark on it. Overwhelmed by the ideal purity of absolute whiteness, he could not bring himself to introduce the disturbing individuality of even just a single stroke of his brush. And uh, the story may not be true, but uh, that it could be true is readily apparent for any fully consistent pursuit of perfect clarity, you see, 
Whether this is in philosophy, then you have these positive philosophies that eventually you see you have just a game of words, or whether it's in mathematics, or whether it's in physics, you see it doesn't matter. Uh, any fully consistent pursuit of perfect clarity must need to arrive utterly nondescript blankness, that is to say, the cleanest, most rarefied form of expression is always the absence of any expression, whatever. And that's sort of, you see, where you end up with materialism. There's nothing left in the end, you see. So the same rule of ever-increasing abstraction has been traveled in science as well. And I mean, there's some beauty in this. Yeah, I'm not protesting that. But uh, in, for example, in classical physics, you see, uh, you have uh, still this idea that well, there are concrete particles, right? And so they have a certain position, and they have a certain uh, direction of motion, and they have velocity, and so forth, and the mass, you see. And uh, so they are various determinants that seem to be still commonsensical, right? But then you go further, I see, and it may not even make any sense what the next page here says to you if you have never studied it, but what exactly does it mean, you see, in quantum physics to say that, um, that um, a quantum wave is a, cl a cloud-like potential for the existence of a material particle to become manifest in observation, you see, that's sort of like, what, what are we saying exactly? Um, you have, um, in quantum physics, basically the abstract forms of you see, of the mathematics, and that's it. And, uh, or for instance, in relativity, you see, um, what exactly does it mean uh, for gravity to be a local curvature effect in a four dimensional space time manifold? What's the manifold? Some sort of bending thing, you see, um, a curving thing, uh, mathematical object, purely mathematical object that bends in other. Um, still higher dimensions, so um, it's like bending into the fifth dimension or the sixth, you see, or whatever. And uh, the answer is that in abstract modern <laughs> theories of physics, uh, there ultimately is no meaning to be sought apart from the mathematical formalism itself. You see, um, the mathematics here is not a drawing or a map that you could, you see, like of a, of a landscape or so that you could actually enter and travel to, but it's actually just, that's all. I mean, there's nothing else to be said. It is actually that very land itself. It's not the land, it's not the map of the land, it's that land itself. But that actually is, ties in, and this needs some interpretation, I think, with actually what it says in the, in the Gospel of John, because it says in the beginning was the word. So I would say, see, this, this uh, idea here that science, you see, um, um, in its mathematical descriptions, gives you this description of physical reality, you see, that's actually the logos, or the word, it says in the original Greek, actually, logos, which the Greek, by the way, meant to be, you see, sort of like a spirit, a, a mind, that gives everything a rational order, right? And um, so that was in the beginning, according to the Gospel of John, but you see, the distinction here, I would say, and that is, you see, where materialism is wrong, is that uh, this logos, you see, this word that was in the beginning, um, the word of the Gospel of John is not actually reductionistic in kind. Instead, it is the rational source of a world that living spirits, you see, your consciousness, your soul, can actually inhabit. And so, what more you see, it's not just actually this um, empty canvas, but there is something you see that actually inhabits that world, and that's our spirits. And um, it does not give rise to austere, purely rational space in red, yellow, and blue, like uh, like a Mondrian painting or an alien mathematical landscape, but an actual phenomenal reality, something you can see, touch, feel, and so forth, you see, with your consciousness. And it is dazzlingly rich in its variety, you see. And uh, the contrast, you see, it's actually, it's all interesting, because Mondrian, he actually lived in this, you see. He lived in his paintings, almost. And, and um, so some scientists lived in their world, you see, in their materialistically reduced world. And so he actually lived in these paintings. And uh, this is a, a reconstruction of a studio in Paris. And uh, so you can see it's, everything is pretty austere. You see there are some color uh, squares here or rectangles here and there. And, uh, and uh, here are some uh, comments on this. You see, I met Mondrian in, by chance. <coughs> Montparnasse was the neighborhood of Paris where most of the artists uh, lived at the time. In the evenings, they often went to the dome and talked with each other about the possibilities of getting exhibitions and so forth. One day, I was sitting there with some people, and someone I knew introduced me. He immediately invited me to come to his studio. From that moment on, we were friends. This is, by the way, Cesar Domela. Uh, 
somebody said uh, when they first went to study that it was me speaking. <laughs> then I'm a 300 years old, you see. <laughs> um, no, I certainly never met Mondrian. Uh, you came directly through the door into the studio. There was a little vestibule where you could hang your jacket. There were no violet colors in the studio, red, yellow, and blue, where hard to see only black and grays. Non colors to this. Uh, you could imagine any, uh, you could, you could not imagine any woman and child in the Mondrian studio. It wouldn't be possible. I made various neoplastic, that's the art style of art, you see, that's what it's, uh, how it's called, neoplastic interiors, myself in Berlin. They've all disappeared. I made my own apartment in Berlin, neoplastic as well, but it's not a place to live in. We used to meet each other in the cafe downstairs as we couldn't stand it there. You cannot live in a painting, you can only, uh, with a painting, you can live with a painting. When we saw that it didn't work, I gave it up. So, actually I tried that also once, I crazy, see, when I was a student, I once did my own apartment also a bit in a similar way, and then I couldn't also stand it, I couldn't stand it, I had to give it up. But anyway, um, uh, just like numbers in mathematics, and this is the connection here, you see, uh, these uh, elements in Mondrian's paintings, these squares, they're basically just um, defined by how they relate to other things. I mean, they're actually nothing in themselves. See, this idea that materials ultimately is based on nothing. Um, we can try to picture a number of cores as a point on the line. You see, it's like a little, little dot, but what is that? You see, it's a nothing at all. Ultimately, therefore, numbers are also no things. You see, they are, they are nothing in themselves. You know, they find entirely by the rules that govern their use and mutual relatedness. You see, cannot go into this little lot detail, you see, but the axioms on which numbers are based, you see, are exactly doing that. They give you rules how numbers are related and how they can be used. And then all of physics is built on that, you see. And so basically everything is built on that in materialistic thinking. And so by implication, uh, and in the light of these, uh, the structural kinship between you see, the numbers and this uh, Mondrian uh, painting style, the universe reduced to mathematical instruction is just as alien and uninhabitable a world as a neoplastic utopia in regular blue. In such a denuded reality space, even man is nothing in himself. That's actually what Mondrian wrote, you see. For he assumes, uh, for he as well assumes his significance only in relation to a whole. It's not that the human being is himself or herself is something, see, it is actually <coughs> only defined by relations, uh, sort of like just uh, square among squares. In essence, one has utopian conception of a rationally used visual environment <coughs> in which man can shed, shed their petty individuality aims at nothing less than the rigorous aesthetic realization of the Cartesian intellectual dream that gave birth, a birth to modern materialistic science. Cartesian dream, that means Ray Descartes. He was the author, you see, of the modern scientific method in the 17th century. For Ray Descartes defined external reality to be mathematically representable, that is to be in a one to one correspondence with a, with a symbolic relational void. Mondrian set out to actually transform that external domain into an image of precisely that void. So he, in his paintings and his slides, he made the universe look as though, you know, we have the space we live in, as though uh, this vision of um, Descartes was actually true. And uh, Descartes did not hesitate to reduce animals to mere machines in order to guarantee their representability in principle by wholly devitalized mathematical symbols. And one of the following students tried to make that utter devitalization directly apparent in visual form. Painted objects in the studio are really not objects at all, but rather patches of color that derive their existence from being related to other such patches. And um, one may rightly wonder, you see, uh, what actually Mondrian would have done with a pet, like my cat, painted it blue, you see, or maybe yellow or red, so that it fits the interior space. The answer most likely is that pets painted or not just cannot be allowed to exist in this kind of purified space in which every object is assigned a stable compositional function. And uh, pets are uncontrollable and therefore unacceptable, right? And so you can see this sort of drains the lifeblood out of everything. You see this, this kind of um, approach to um, yeah, philosophical thinking or whatever it is you see. And so uh, to uh, finish this here now, um, see we return to this idea that control, right? With, um, Knowledge, we have more control, we think, you see, of um, the world that we live in and so forth, and thus we return to the promise of control held out to us by scientific knowledge for what makes 
mathematics and this art of Montreal so strongly attractive to certain human minds is not only the aesthetic experience of absolute clarity, but also the sense that both of these worlds appear to be in coherent worlds that human reason can fully contain. This, the, this possibility of being rationally in control that Descartes boldly asserted with respect of the physical world and then Montreal in turn purpose to make directly apparent in, in, by visual means. Reality in both of these systems is compressed into a handy scheme that human beings that, uh, can imagine themselves to be completely in charge of so control. The entire material world from this Cartesian reductive perspective is a mathematical system that reason can penetrate and that and the neoplastic universe by virtue of its structural kinship really looks as though this perspective virtually. And uh, yeah, this is the last slide here. The truth, however, is that this promise of control is totally illusory. The logos provides the world with a rational order that is beautiful in its mathematical purity, but in doing so, it only sets the stage. It establishes the grounds, as it were, on which a free human life can be enacted, but it does not supply the meaning or the essence of that life. As humans, we are not to cling to false securities in knowledge, but rather are to, walk, are to freely walk the earth in simplicity and trust in as followers of Jesus. Right? So that's, you see, where materialism is, is uh, completely off. So that's basically what I have. And